So um, not only want to welcome everybody who's, um, who's tuned in, but also um, our, our two outsiders in the Loire, um, Sarah Huang from Domaine Huet and Brendan Sater West. Um, we really were excited first and foremost to talk about Chinin from two um, iconic places, but to also get the perspective of people who are uh, coming at it from really unique vantage points. And um, so this was an opportunity to do so. And our goal is uh, for Sarah and Brendan to be doing the bulk of the talking. Brian and I will jump in here and there. And as, um, as Brian mentioned earlier, the chat function is always available for you. Um, so if you have questions or comments or anything, um, please use that, that um, option. And then if you want to engage using your actual mic, um, just give a heads up in the chat uh, room and Brian will, um, Brian will unmute you. So, um, so I think we'll get going from there. Um, we really wanted to kind of kick it off by um, hearing some origin stories. If both Sarah and Brendan could give us an idea of how from their uh, respective New Jersey and Oregon um, native lands, they found their, their ways to the Loire. So I think, um, Sarah, if you want to start and then, and then Brendan. You sure. Hi, everybody. I hope everybody is doing well and safe and healthy and enjoying their weekend. Um, on, on, our, on our end, uh, we're a family of four, and I was uh, born and raised in New Jersey. Um, and we landed here in Vouvray, you know, thanks simply to um, a deep love of wine and um, having a connection to nature. It was something that was always part of, you know, going generations back and on both sides of our family, just lo loving gardening and being outside and, and just being in nature, quite honestly. So. My father, Anthony, he discovered wine while he was getting a PhD in, um, in physics. Um, and he loved that in wine, there were always these just ever-changing variables, right? So just in the vineyards, there's, you know, you're talking about the temperature and the, the soil types, the current season, you know, the impact that the last season had um, on the current season. And, uh, you know, the varietal, of course, the clone, the treatments, you know, there are all of these variables and it means that there was a lot to absorb and unpack and, and learn about. And for somebody who's, you know, with his physics mind, um, the, 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 the idea of infinity and the unknown was just the best for him. And so for as long as we can remember, it was something that our family was just really passionate about. It was something that we grew up in. Um, and, and I think that it was, you know, one of the ways amongst, obviously as a family, you know, there's a lot of different things, but it was one of the things that really brought us together. Um, so our first foray onto this side of the industry, this producer side, was, was actually due to a, a love of sweet wines with great acids. Um, not always the, uh, the popular opinion, but, but um, it was something, a great Riesling, a great Shannon was, was, was quite often on the table. And so um, what we did was uh, we established a winery out in Tokai called Kirai Udvar, and that was in 1996. Um, so we were actually in Tokai first before, before, before hitching out to Vufre. Um, and we had the wonderful opportunity to become a part of U.S. story in 2003. Um, time flies, you know, I kind of forget that the aughts exist. And so, you know, I think 2003 was just a few years ago, but now it's been almost, you know, 20, almost 20 years, 17 years. Um, Anyway, so what, what wine meant for us, for our family, um, before ending up here in Vouffre, it really actually hasn't changed. Um, it's that beautiful idea that wine is a vessel and it's, it's there simply to bring people together, to create memories, to reminisce. To reminisce. And, um, and that was something that was just, that's what wine is, it's this joyful vessel. And it was ingrained in us from a really young age that what's in this glass, it's not just a product of, of that year, but of, of generations of work and sweat and blood and sometimes tears and, and of course experience, right? So where Whitney is and Claude du Borg, those vines were planted right behind her in 1985. Well, in 1985, there was a team working that was planting those vines. And every year you have people that have taken care of, of, of 
the, 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 the soil and, and the plant and, and have kind of had their exchange of energy too. And so, you know, that is what it means to us. And I think that ideally that, that always remains, that it's something we're, we're doing something with love. And, and I think that's something that the world needs. I know that sounds really pokey. Um, anyway, yeah, so this is, this is outsiders in the war. Um, and I think from, from, from the point of view of being an outsider, I think no matter where you live or what you do, it's natural to wonder who people are, right? Um, and, and, and maybe also at times to make certain assumptions. That, that's what it is also to be human, is, is to think and assume, and, and, and that's okay. Sometimes you're right, sometimes you're, you're happily wrong. Um, but ultimately, it's one of those things where you spend time, uh, you get to know each other, you interact and you see kind of the walls come down. Um, and I think that's no matter where you are, whether you know, you're young, you're going to school, whether you're coming from Jersey to Louvre, where you know, there's a few more now, but it's not kind of the most popular place that it should be. Um, anyway, so kindness and humanity win 10 times out of 10. Um, and, and I think that the idea of an outsider is, is something that kind of everybody grapples with, um, but it's what you make of it. Um, yeah, hi. Sarah, hi. when did you and Hugo move? Um, so we moved Uber? out here in, uh, in January 2012 full time. Okay. So we've been here now for about eight and a half years. Oh. And it's been, it's been a wild ride. I mean, I'm sure we'll talk about it later, but um, uh, vintages have been really, really extreme. There's, there's been a lot of, of you know, um, climatic catastrophes linked to, to, we believe are linked to climate change. Um, we're on that front line as, as farmers, because uh, that's ultimately what we are. And, and that's the beauty of wine, because you never know what you're going to get. But it's also, we've seen vintages in the last eight years where no matter who you talk to, old, old and old, um, people with tons and tons of experience are like, we've never seen anything like that. We've never seen anything like this. And of course, you try to, you try to find a vintage, I mean, that's normal, as what, doing what we do, you try to find these comparisons to have an idea of which way you're gonna go. Um, but it's kind of just throwing it all up in the air and, and it's about having conversations, it's about talking, it's about just doing the most to understand and pay attention to all the details and, um, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Brendan, on to you. So good evening. Well, good day. Good evening to everybody. Um, hope everybody's doing well. And just thank you. I wanted to thank you first and foremost for taking the time to uh, tune into the story of what uh, Sarah and I are up to. And, um, you know, for um, just this opportunity to, to get geeky and to talk about Shina and um, in different sites. Um, so thanks. Um, I'm originally, I'm an Oregonian. Uh, I moved to France back in 2007, uh, originally to teach English in Paris. I taught there for a couple of years, got hooked on wine. I'm giving you guys a really short story, but the short story is I got hooked on wine through a coworker uh, and as the French say, I got the virus, you know, and I think that's a very appropriate thing to say right now, but I got the virus um, back in 2009 and uh, went through different trainings and certifications, learned more about wine while I was living in Paris. Worked in retail and that was um, for a couple of years and that was really good. Gave me a good insight as to how wines sold, distributed, uh, presented and everything. And I was just frustrated living in a big city, um, coming from Oregon, from the Willamette Valley in particular, just not being able to be in touch with, kind of like Sarah was, Sarah was saying, always, I grew up in nature. And, you know, when you grow up in nature and you're always outside and you're always running up trees and touching the dirt, <laughs> getting dirty. I mean, it's like living in a city is hard. And, um, and so for me, it was just, I had to get out. And uh, it was the perfect, it was, Timing was right, um, and at that time I was actually selling the wines of Domaine Giberto, uh, and I was just—I mean—they were my favorite wines I was selling, 
And every time we would get our allocation, I would sell, you know, sell them to clients as quickly as possible. And I, I was thinking to myself, this is, this is silly. I need to, I need to call them and actually find out if there's a way that I could work for them and learn how to make wine from our own year to own. So long story short, back in 2012, I called and harassed him. Uh, and he ended up giving in and uh, he said, I'm going to take you under as my apprentice. Uh, don't have any other apprentices up until this date. So you're going to be kind of my, you're going to be my guinea pigs. <laughs> so, uh, he took me under his arm in 2012. And then during that time, it was a lot of just observation, hanging out, hanging out outside of work with him. I mean, because this is the, the beauty of apprenticeships often in France is that there's a, there's an, there can be an aspect of you, you're, you're an apprentice, but you're also almost welcomed into the family. He welcomed me into his family. So I was hanging out with him on the outside out of, out of um, work and we were going to Clover Jar tasting or going to Alto tasting, tasting around uh, the, all these different producers in the area. And then even he was taking me to elsewhere, other regions, Champagne, Burgundy. And it was just like a huge change for me and a huge um, opportunity for me to grow in the knowledge that I had about wine, about viticulture, about winemaking. And during that time, I got uh, more and more thinking of, I really would like to start something myself on a really, really small scare, scale. And so he had some vineyards, Les Chapeaudes, which is uh, the first wine that I made back in 2015. And back in 2015, he said, okay, I have, I have a vineyard that I, I, don't, I don't need it necessarily, but if you would like to lease it out, you can lease it out. And so, I signed on for a lease with that, and um, 15 was my first vintage. That's only a vineyard of one hectare, so two and a half acres small. And back in 2018, so recently, I was able to acquire two and a half more hectares in the site of Breze, um, in the Sumer area, which definitely was um, kind of the opportunity of a lifetime, the second opportunity of a lifetime for me, and, and uh, here I am now. That's great, Brendan. Thanks for uh, thanks for sharing. Um, so we were thinking to take the conversation to kind of a Shenan specific one, and we were wondering if Sarah, if you could start us off with this, with a description of like what what really is the story behind Shenan from Vouvray? What is what is it about? Help us help us understand the impact the place has on the grape. I mean, I think that's such a loaded question. Um, the place is everything, right? So for us, um, well, the wines, and I, 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 Brennan will say the same thing, the wines are made in the vineyards. Um, and so when you have, you know, a parcel that you're really passionate about that has amazing terroir, and the job is there. Um, and so, so in that place is everything, right? You can't take the vines out of the place. And, and what, you know, our aim, every year and it's always been this tradition of the estate is is really to highlight our three terroirs um, through the lens of you know the growing season so whatever that might mean if it's you know in Vouvray we have this amazing opportunity where um, we produce sparkling and dry uh, sparkling and still and then the still wines from, from dry to sweet so um, we can really uh, not really play around but but follow what what nature gives us um, we're not beholden to one certain wine type, and so we can respect the natural balance of, of each vintage, which I think is is something really special. And it's it's not many varietals that you can do that with. Um, that that you know, with all of these different balances, with a little bit of residual sugar, with a lot of residual sugar, you can still have something that that's not cloying, that's that's super balanced, it's finishing dry, and it has this amazing ageability. And 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 for us, obviously, there's the work. Um, which is really important, working the soils and, and just working how we work, but, but there's, it's, it's the place too. And, and we're lucky because we have um, three parcels with very, very, very different terroirs. Um, and it was Gaston Huet that, that had this vision um, back when it wasn't necessarily something that people thought about, but he said, for me, I want three really distinct parcels that, will then have three different, really different characters. 
um, and we're gonna we're gonna highlight these parcels and that they're they're what you know to 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 him and and throughout kind of this this story of Uet that's that's just been the basic idea. Um, we are lucky to work where we work, and so just to, to show off the, the, the beauty of what we have, it's as simple as that. Obviously, it gets it can get a little bit complicated, um, um, but it's as simple as that. I think that that where you are and the place that you're coming from is is wholly important. Mm -hmm. Sarah, can you talk a little bit about the the history of? Domenuet as one of the earliest adopters of, of first organic and then biodynamic farming, not only in the Loire, but in, in all of, in of France. France. Yeah, so um, it was back at a time when it wasn't necessarily the most popular thing. I think often kind of throughout the years and when we've taken certain, certain decisions, uh, people around would be like, okay, what's going on? You guys are crazy. And there's always something like that. But um, we started uh, due to a chance encounter um, with uh, Francois Boucher, um, uh, we decided to do a test parcel of biodynamic farming um, in 1988 in Closey Borg, actually. Um, and what we saw just from, you know, if you want to talk like scientific proof sense of things was greener, you know, uh, more even ripening, rounder juices, um, right off the bat, the vines kind of returned back to their natural color. Other, you know, they, they were this the really, really bright green at first. And, you know, in the history of the state, we never used chemical fertilizers or pesticides. Um, but kind of just taking it to this next step where we're farming how our ancestors are farming. We're being respectful to, to how, you know, to, to nature. Um, we decided to convert and we were certified uh, in 1993 um, by, uh, by Demeter. And it's now just become, you know, how we work and what we do. Uh, it's what we believe. Everybody has their own way of working and their, their own philosophy that they adhere to, right? And, that, and there's room for everyone. And that's another beautiful thing about, about wine is kind of the acceptance of differences. Um, but, but for us, um, we're, we're, we're all connected. We're all interconnected. We're all, we're all controlled. We're all, you know, majority water. Um, and, and the moon and the stars and constellations, there's an effect there. And so when you're, you're farming based on the lunar cycle, you gotta believe in the moon, first of all. But, um, but yeah, so, so um, it's what we do, it's how we work. Um, you work how you think is best. I think that's what everybody does. Um, and for us, biodynamic farming, it's, it's just what we do. Um, and it's really important to us. I hope everybody's drinking something right now. I don't want to feel alone by drinking some chin on, right? Oh, here. Oh, yeah, right here. Okay, okay cool. Thanks. Cheers, guys. <laughs> um, yeah, and so and so when when we, you know, we make the decision, as I was speaking to you a little bit earlier, of, of really producing whatever nature gives us. And, and um, because we have the opportunity with all of these different wine types, that could mean a multitude of different um, references or cuvées per year or just a few um, and we never go into a growing season saying or even a harvest saying okay we need x amount of bottles of this kind of wine I mean the idea behind biodynamics is harmony and balance right and so if you even try to make you know a certain type of wine you're pushing something that it's just not naturally there and that has an effect on, on, on the ageability of the wines and the balance, the enjoyability, and that's just something that is kind of unacceptable to us. Um, uh, so, we're, so we're really purists in that way. So you could have a vintage like we had in 2018. That was a, it was a hot vintage and it was a, it was a, sweet, a sweet wine vintage um, where we made, you know, 80% sweet style. Um, and then you could have a vintage like 2019, also a really hot vintage. Um, crazy, crazy heat waves, the vines, uh, they kind of shut down, they needed to self-protect, we worked the soils, we worked the soils to, to, to make sure that any drop of water that existed would go down to the roots and, and you know, that the, 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 the eventual bunches would come to maturity, um, and it worked, but um, interestingly enough, a really hot vintage in 19, where there weren't really any reserves of water either, it's a, it's a sec vintage, um, and so, we just we just kind of just roll with the flow. 
And those decisions are ultimately made in the weeks, days leading up to harvest and are not made in the cellar. No, never. No, it's made, you know, weeks, days, even hours, right? It could be a last minute snap decision to, um, to, to, to go out and harvest for us. It's really when we, we um, you know, obviously there's lab analysis, but a lot of it is experience and understanding the vines and how they, how they, how they grow, how they ripen, um, and what can wait and what can't wait. But we are looking for kind of that pinnacle of balance between sugar and acidity, obviously potential alcohol, but so that like on taste, there's, there's good structure. Um, and once the wines are, once the, the, the juice is there, then we go out and, and we harvest. Um, so we don't ultimately actually know what we're harvesting um, until the juice is pressed. And our aim is to to press to press the purest juice we can. You know, and, and vintages will be different. If you have riper riper stems, for example, um, it's it's a little bit easier. If you have vintages where the stems aren't as ripe, and you got to be real careful. It kind of depends on the thickness of the skins, or you know, obviously, it's kind of going back to the reason our family just loves this is because there's so many different variables, um, and you, 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 there's not too much time to twiddle your thumbs. Yeah. So yeah, we know what we have once the, the juice is pressed, and then and then we just it's a gentle. Um, accompaniment uh, through vinification. So when we say that the, the, the wines are made in the fields, uh, they're really made in the fields. We do, we have a sorting table in the fields so that whatever comes down to the press is pristine. Um, and we go from there and then bottling is uh, always usually in the month of April. Great. So Brendan, um, taking, it, taking it over to some more. Mm -hmm. um, Let's talk identity and uh, nature versus nurture here. Sure. So I guess, I mean, the Somer area today is mostly known for, for the appellation of Somer Champigny. Uh, Somer Champigny being an appellation where only Cabernet Franc is grown. Um, so in the area, I would say about uh, maybe 80% of the planted vineyards our Cabernet Franc, uh, the rest being Chenin Blanc. So really actually small production of Chenin Blanc actually being made in Somere. However, <laughs> no producers in Somere have any Chenin Blanc to sell. So it's kind of like the tables, the tides are turning and things are changing. There's an interest for Chenin Blanc in Somere because um, there are different sites in Somere, um, which I think through the process of, uh, you know, farming and vinifying separately, bottling separately, that many producers were, were collectively being able to, um, you know, figure out that there's really, really interesting sites. Historically, you have to understand that Somer, even though now it's a mostly Cabernet Franc that's being grown, historically it's actually uh, a, a, a place, um, most of the terroirs are actually more appropriate for Chenin Blanc than they are for Cabernet Franc. Everything turned back in 1956, 1957, when the appellation of Sommer Champigny was created. So everybody, you know, was drinking. Actually, well, a lot of people, in, at least in this area, in Paris and kind of in the bistros, people were drinking rosé. That was kind of like the your average Joe kind of drink. And so everybody, kind of the fad was to drink rosé. And so everybody ripped up their shin and put on Cabernet Franc to make rosé. Unfortunately, and, well, fortunately, Breze, where I farm my grapes, Breze is a site that's about 15 minutes south of Sommier. Um, uh, it's historically a site for Chenin Blanc that was uh, even being farmed by the Carmelite monks back early as back, because we have documents. Roman has documents in his family, Roman gave it to his family. Documents going back to 15th century, uh, showing that the Carmelites were farming Chenin Blanc in uh, you know, in Breze. So they were sending their wines off to Mont Saint Michel down to Avignon where the, the boat was. So there's historical proof that this is, these are serious terroirs. I mean, wherever the monks are, were, I mean, we're often. They knew what they were doing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, we all know that wherever they were in France and where the sites that they were farming, they knew what they were doing. I mean, without, without the technology that we have today. Um, so, at least I would say, I mean, to get back to your question, when is just that I think what makes Shona really special 
um, especially coming from somewhere even more so in Brazil, is just the energy. There's this electric, um, I would say it's not just acidity, the acidity is screaming. I mean, we always have really, really low pHs, high acidity is coming from, um, come from Breze, you know, and Somir in general, but, but Breze, there's, there's this kind of, um, it's kind of like you're putting your fingers in an electric socket and you're getting electrocuted and it kind of feels really good. I think that's what makes, makes it really this weird, it's this almost violent pleasure that you get when drinking wines. Um, and I don't know how everybody else responds to that, but that's how I like it. And because it gives us this, um, it gives us this profile that uh, actually over time will mellow out and will actually become really, the acidity becomes integrated into the wine. And depending on how we age it and everything, it's when the, the when it, the wines become, you know, really in, in, in the right place at the right time, it's just like, it can be a magical experience. Um, and so I think for me, Breze is really particular just because we have a diversity of terroirs um, on such a small site. Breze itself is only 400 planted hectares. So really small. I mean, this is our, for us in Sumer, it's kind of our small burgundy and that's why we love it. There's a diversity of terroir, uh, different types of soils, different expositions. And unfortunately, until now, there are only about, I mean, you can count on both my hand, my two hands how many producers are actually making wines just from Brazil? I mean, out of 400 hectares, and unfortunately most of it's going to the co local cooperative. So there's a lot of work that we're doing to try to get other growers interested in the sites that they're growing their grapes on, having them taste with us. Um, more and more people are getting out of the cooperative, starting to make a little bit of wine themselves, under their own label, you know, single vineyard bottlings and everything like that. So there's progress that's being made and I'm really happy to be here because as an American, I think maybe it's our kind of progressive side or kind of our pioneering side, but I feel like I'm part of uh, a movement and a part of an energy of um, something collective happening uh, for the well-being of the Sumer area. And for Shana as a, as a, as a bridal as a whole. So Brendan, I love that, uh, that analogy of kind of getting electrocuted. Yeah. Um, so to like, <laughs> to pick up on that, if, if that's your take on the personality of Shannon from, from your little corner of the Loire Valley, what is the personality of, of Fouvre? Like what's the, what's that compare contrast? Like, are we really talking about two very distinct personalities or is there more at play? And Sarah, obviously feel free to submit your own uh, geeky analogy. All right, Brian, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> this is where it breaks down. It's like battle time, you know. <laughs> For this, but, uh, I mean, on my my opinion, when I taste wines from Bouvre, it's um, it's not the same type of acidity. It's almost like, and there's a certain different type of like flesh to the wine. Also, I mean, it's like we're trying to compare things that it's like trying to compare different forms of bodies with, you know, it's different forms of different ethnic races. I mean, it's just so many different things that we're trying. I to totally compare agree. With and it's impossible to compare it, and that's the beauty of it, is this different expression of it. And right, is that we don't, we don't actually need to. We can appreciate, you know, what each region is, is, is putting out there, because, you know, even within the regions, the, the practices are so different. And, um, and so, you know, if, if we say, okay, this producer in Vouvre or this producer in Somuri can be one thing, but you change a producer and... and Practices are totally different in the vineyards and in the cellars. Um, so I think it's, it's super complicated. Yeah. Um, and I think I agree with you, Brennan. It's really just we can, we can appreciate each, you know, each region for what it has to offer. And that's why we're all here together today. That's why we love wine is because there are so many different styles um, that we can enjoy and learn about and taste and, and also discuss. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's the beauty of it. At least, I mean, that's where I can jump in and, and actually make a link to one of my first experiences with Sean was actually with uh, Le Mans in 2008. Was it Denis? Which is a beautiful vintage. I mean, kind of a hard, not uh, written off by the press and everything in 2008, often in, in France, the French press and everything. I don't know what it was like in the United States, but I mean, a beautiful vintage that I like. And it was one of my first big emotions that I had with Chenin Blanc. Wow, that's 
Oh, yeah, really. And then and then I had 2008 birthday from Domain Giberto, and I was like, this is a whole, this is this is something else too. I mean, like, this is just, I mean, and they both spoke to me, and that's interesting. Same vintage, and here we are today, and just how the universe comes brings us back together. And, yeah. And, 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 and for me, it's, I think if I'm to kind of, if you guys want to make it a little more cookie cut, separate things, for me, there's something about, there's an edginess, maybe an austerity to the Shunan that comes from Breze, from Somir, that maybe that I'm not tasting as much in Vouvray. Um, maybe it's just, I'm speaking out of ignorance and naivete, as this is my per taste. This is where it gets interesting, Sarah. There you go. Like, that's good. Oh, that was good. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I would probably agree with you. I think I think that the terroir counts. Um, you want to, you know, here there's there's a lot there's that we've got our two folly. It's super chalky, and so um, I think that that creates a style in general. I mean, our three terroirs. So that's Pozzi Borg. It's a, a little bit more powerful, a little rounder. Yeah. Um, a little bit less austere, right? And then you have Le Mont, where it's it's flint. Yeah. super super compact yellowish greenish clay um and so yeah so if we're going to talk about even within Vouvray, even within you know what we do one producer we got three totally different styles in in in, in close bourgogne and Le Mans. um and then from year to year it, it, it can really change um i think that uh, this is kind of an offshoot because you know now you know 30 30 years into the biodynamic farming you know, we're seeing, we're in, in this other phase, we're right off the bat, right out of the press, the, the, the juices are coming out and they're their personality of, of terroir. Mm -hmm. But my point is, is that the tower makes a difference. And so when we have the tufo, when there is that impact, of course, that austerity is, is, is going to be affected, right? Okay, um, I have a question. It also like depends on the vintage. Can I ask you directly a question? Yeah, um, sure. Like, how is, is, like how much of botrytis you not like a something that you guys like tolerate, accept, deal with as a generally speaking on your terroirs? Yeah, so botrytis is what botrytis is. Yeah, you know the thing about botrytis is that when you have pastoriage, when the, the, the berries are just simply shriveled, right? For, to us, that's kind of the purest form of shenan. The addition of botrytis is just, it's, it's an addition. So you're adding kind of another layer on top of what the production is. And for us, that's okay, because if the vintage gives you botrytis, that's what the vintage is. The reality is in the last, in the last 20 or so years, we didn't have a full box size vintage between 1997, which was, and 2015. Wow. Right, so, so, you know, every year, kind of depending on the weather, we might have five to 15%, but it, it hasn't been something that's really impacted us um, too much. It's, I mean, we say, we'll just leave that to Tokai. But, um, <laughs> yeah, but it's not, some, it's not something that, oh my God, there's botrytis, what, what do we do? Yeah, it, it's, part of, it's part of what nature's given us and, and we're gonna work around it and, and it, it changes things up also. Sure. Um, which is really nice. Yeah. That was a good question. Does anybody oh, else out here have just, a question? I was just curious because, you know, at far farming, you know, that's one of the things that you learn when you're you know, kind of a novice and you learn how about farming. I mean, these are small details, but every site and within every site, there are certain spots or terroirs that are more sensitive to botrytis. Humidity. To, and, and, yeah. I mean, but it also kind of depends on if, if and when the rain comes. Mm -hmm. the growing right. Yeah. Um, and uh, to be honest, like I said, we don't we don't search for botrytis. But um, in 2015, when that rain came on August, I think it was August 17th, yeah. we were super excited. We're like, we're gonna have botrytis this year. It's been a while. It's 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 fun. Um, and and so yeah, yeah. It's there's all those factors that that come into play, and um, they, they keep. I mean, I think that you would agree as part of why we do what we do. It keeps, it keeps you thinking and it keeps you on your toes. And you have to kind of be proactive, but also reactive at the same time. Um, so there's just a lot of things in play. 
There's a question from the audience, Sarah. It's uh, about the, the percentage of dry wines versus sweet wines every vintage. They were well, wondering. Totally, it totally changes. Um, there's, there's no rule. And I know that makes it hard for, I mean, it makes it hard for us. It makes it hard for the consumer that, um, you know, one year you might have what I'm drinking right now. Or I had two bottles of it, the Jersey in me. Um, I have a, a 2002 Limon, uh, Limon Premier Tree right now. But it's kind of the beauty is that from, from one year to the next, you might not have, you know, the same wine. Um, uh, percentage, you can't even, it's not even something, we don't even track those numbers because um, basically you could have a sec of demi sec, a moala, a premier tree from, that's all single vineyard. So that's 12 wines. There are times when we do our Franc de Pied, so the ungrafted vines. We have our sparkling, we have our Cuvée Constance, right? So that's 15 different wines in any given vintage. Um, I think in 15, 16, 17, we made probably 12 or 13 Cuvées out of the 15, which is, which is honestly, it's fun, but it's intense. Um, and in 2019, we made a base wine for, for sparkling, and we have a sec from each parcel and a, a demi-sec from Le Mans. Um, and uh, so, so it, it can really, 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 really change. Um, and and you know, some we were we were talking earlier a little bit about about you know the the ever changing climate and the impact that that has, and, and how you know sometimes there are people that rail on certain vintages because oh X Y or Z happens. And what I always say is when when we hear about some sort of catastrophe, be it you know frost or hail or mildew or you know anything doesn't sure there's there are going to be vintages that are that are harder and, and maybe not to some people's liking as much as others that's natural we all have opinions on on what we like and what we don't like but it doesn't necessarily mean either that just because there was there was hail the wines aren't going to be good it just means there's going to be less but if the work is there and the attention is there and the commitment is there and the hope is there too because there's that exchange as well in the vines um, that's really what counts and there's enough for me as really rarely does it have something to do with the quality per se i have a quick question just to follow up on that um you had once said that for domain you at the most kind of glorious of vintages is when you are able to produce everything from sparkling all the way to Cuvée Constance. Yeah. Um, I know that there have not been many of those vintages. Was 2015 the last vintage where that was the case? 2015 was the last vintage where that was. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and the reason I, I say that, just to clarify for, for everyone, is, is because it's there that we see the, the real magic of Shenan. In the same exact vintage, you know, on any given one vine, you could have different wine types. And, and when you have those wine types, that means that the balance is there, that, that throughout the growing season, there is this consistency of, of, of maturity where you have the opportunity to, to kind of make what you're interested in making. And that is something rare. You know, Shannon's, and Brendan, you'll, you'll agree, I'm totally sure, is that Shannon can get really, really complicated here during harvest. Like the weather gets sometimes real crappy. Um, it, there's always competing, um, you know, atmospheric pressures in play, and, and Shannon has a really delicate skin. Um, so when you're, you're faced with a situation where you, where, you know, you feel a little bit more at ease, you can, you can make a few choices, that's, that's always something that's really nice and welcome. Yeah, yeah, it's for sure. It's it's not a it's not a simple grape. I mean, at the same time, I say that I've never worked with any other grapes. Yeah. Since kind of like, <laughs> that's all I know, um, which is maybe a blessing in disguise. But um, yeah, I mean, the sites according to where we are, we're going back to that. It's different. I would say, from for myself speaking, and I think for Domingue Gato, where I also make the wines, you know, picking dates is just kind of one thing that it's like just we are so stressed like in our head we are preoccupied and just not, We're insane. not well <laughs> yeah i mean because it's like do we do it do we go do we not go you know looking at the weather 
every hour and 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 it's the beauty of it and at the same time it's the hardest thing maybe for me psychologically in the year and yet it's what makes me love this job i will not stop doing and that's just the beauty of it life is hard things are not hard viticulture is not easy you know and this is the beauty it's like it's in that difficulty that it's often that we well you know, and it kind of goes back to like the humanity of it too right? you, you, you make these decisions and for us, it's, you know, our way is, uh, it's by committee, and the more opinions that we have on the table with our team, it's a great team, the, the better. But you make these decisions, and, and going into it, you, you don't really know if you're making the right ones, and that's what's so stressful. Should we be going somewhere else? Should we be, to, you know, like, what is the universe telling us to do? And you only know the answer, what, like? four or five months later after a vacation, if you made the right choice, really, yeah. the reality is that. Um, but, but I think that's like kind of that life lesson where you're all just doing the best you can. And yeah. sometimes you're going you're gonna to make the right decision. Sometimes you're, you're not, but it's okay because it's always changing and it's, yeah. it's what you have. Yeah. And I think that's the notion of like terror that I, often, I think is left out is this aspect of there's, you know, vintage there's the soil there's the variety and yet there's the winemaker and we often leave that part out because mm -hmm. the terroir is not a terroir if there's not the person that's there to interpret it. Right. that's my opinion i mean that's where i come from it and you know like i i think where you know we have a really tr difficult but you know, you know a privileged job to be able to be there and to be kind of in tune and be kind of sensitive to those to those things and everything and at least you know, you were speaking about climate change. One of the things I wanted to, to jump on was at least for to think and to, to realize for us, one of the challenges that we're seeing is that window, at least, you know, harvested was more spread out over time uh, previously, and now it's shortened it up. So in terms of like when certain sites were not ripe, we could let it let the grapes hang, let them ripen a little bit more. Now all of a sudden it's kind of like, Go. Uh -oh. like everything's getting ripe really quickly. <laughs> what are we going to do? How are we going to do this? And that's one of the challenges that we're facing now and we're having to learn how to adapt to in terms of our viticulture practices, how to change that maybe to try to find that, you know, that spacing that was, a little yeah. bit more um, as it was before naturally. But now we're gonna have to change a little bit more how we approach the viticulture side of things to make that um, kind of- Yeah, it's, it's just always hard to say because you don't know the impacts of, of, right. of what's happening, right? Because we can agree that climate change is real and so there's automatically an effect I mean, we can all we during this 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 crazy world that we live in right now with confinement honestly it's like i live in an aviary the birds were so loud and it was amazing and, and we loved every second of it and then you know two days after confinement here was over you just hear them less but the fact that you know if we all disappear all us humans disappear just for a couple of months there's an immediate impact on the wildlife around us, including insects and, you know, everything. What impact could those two months have potentially on the vines? But also, yeah. like, we're in uncharted waters just in general. Because does, does, does it make a difference in, in the type of yeasts that we have mm -hmm. in the cellars? You know, like, what are those unknown factors that, that we can't visually measure or sometimes not even think of um, that are affecting kind of how berries ripen or how fermentation goes there's just so much unknown um and it never stops so mm -hmm. I, I mean obviously like you said you just kind of have to love it and you and you have to be excited by what we do to survive <laughs> mm, yeah because it's a lot yeah and yeah. brendan now you're going to um make things even more interesting with the addition of Cabernet Franc. Yeah, so I poured myself a little bit. <laughs> Just to change things, yeah. I know we were talking about Shannon and everything, that's what you reunites us in. It's, it's all. Yeah, Cabernet well, Franc is, a, is kind of a new, is new to me. I mean, even though I was making it uh, on the label de Maguirito with Roman um, up until 2018, I acquired um, one and a half hectares back in 18 in Brezé on a site that's called La Ripaille, which is most notably known for uh, La Ripaille of Domaine du of Antoine Foucault, um, son of uh, deceased uh, Charlie Foucault um, of Clojure. And um, so La Ripaille is really interesting terroir. It's more of a terroir that's, uh, it's in Brezé. Um, 
it's facing southwest west uh kind of on some clay sand soil um, it's not very deep it's for sure much more of an appropriate site i think to grow chenin blanc but um you know these are old vine cabernet front so i'm not going to necessarily i don't you know have any interest in ripping them out um but they're you know 65 70 year old vines and they're doing great um still producing really great fruit um still getting decent yields to keep me afloat and everything so um, yeah, Cabernet Franc is kind of my new, uh, next to Chenin, because I think it is, unfortunately, it's kind of that second child that maybe is not perceived or loved in the same way, I'll we'll say it that way. Uh, and, um, you know, oh, thanks, Brian, for pulling that up. Um, yeah, so Louis probably is kind of on the bottom of the screen. Um, and uh, it's, it's, um, a really interesting and challenging uh, site to work with. Um, you know, ripening goes pretty quickly. Uh, we're often finding the grapes are ripening kind of the same time as mid harvest actually for some of our whites. So we're having to bring them in at the same time. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm a big advocate for and that I'm really um, wanting to promote is, uh, you know, helping people change the perception of Cabernet Franc. Let's just say that I'm wanting to go towards much more of an ethereal, feminine, light, delicate uh, style of Cabernet Franc than I think what a lot of people are historically, have historically done. And that's not trying to be pretentious. I'm just saying that I have a vision that's much more uh, proper and much more clear to me and much different than what I think people have and are doing because I'm an outsider and that's the beauty of being an outsider is I have the freedom and I can do what I want to do and there's nobody that's going to tell me else. <laughs> I'm, that's, I'm an American, you know, so don't, don't tell me what I can do or not. I, uh, um, and I, with that said, I'm, I'm wanting to, I'm lightening up on the time that the juice is on skin. So for my 2018 lottery pie, it's only seven days on skin. Um, for my other bottling that I do, just my Somme Rouge, it's only four days. Um, I'm looking for much more juiciness, uh, much more of, once, as I said, that kind of ethereal um, kind of gamay or even Pinot Noir type structure um, that I think is possible to have. But once again, we're, we need to go back to how the grapes are farmed in the vineyard, be able to get ripeness uh, to, you know, and, and also a certain amount of sun exposure and everything so that I can get phenolic ripeness also in the, in the grapes so that I can pull out a little bit of, you know, tannin, a little bit of, um, you know, Matière, as the French would say, without, you know, um, having the wine be too thin. So there's this beautiful uh, process that I'm in the process of also trying to understand and learn as to, you know, how to extract in the most delicate way, getting something out of it without uh, having the wines be too thin and hold out, if that was to say. So that's my challenge. 2019 was my second vintage. Uh, so it's, it's all fresh. It's fun. I'm having a blast doing it. And um, you know, everybody's back home is going to be able to taste the 19 soon too. So that's very exciting. Is there a percentage of free run versus pressed? I only work with free run juice, so okay. all my pressed juice I disregard. Um, it's really texturally, it's 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 not what I'm looking for, and so I I, I sacrifice, you know, a certain amount of volume that I could be selling. And I would, well, selling. It's my style that I want, so no pressed juice. I, I think just to piggyback a little bit where you're going, part of the reason I asked the question is because I, I know that that's one of the not so secret, but I think fundamental elements of, of Clos Rougeard is that um, at least Borg and Poya um, are all free run. Right. Um, and um, I would love to know from both of you, I think Brian as well, we discussed this earlier, um, reference points or inspirations. It doesn't necessarily have to be with the varieties that you're working with. It could be farming inspirations in other regions, but people who have um, influenced you are wines that have influenced you um, on your path. Um, I'm going to jump in really quickly um, and give a kind of another <laughs> um, tip my hats off to Michel and Thibaut Chauvray here in Somer of Clos de l'Equitar. Um, they're brought in by Grand Prix Selections also. 
Um, Michel used to, Shiver used to be the right arm of uh, Thierry Germain with um, Dominic Rushnev here in Somir, and probably one of the most talented men that I've ever met with his hands in terms of how he can make things, change tools into whatever you have, and just in terms of the farmer, in terms of his uh, understanding of biodynamic farming, and farming as a whole. Um, and he, yeah, so I, I would say they're definitely the model for me locally of what they're doing. Also, their wines are electric also. They're in much different terroirs. Just totally um, great. I mean, those are, that's the case. I mean, I can go to a whole other list of other producers in, in other regions and everything, but um, I would say I want to tip my hats off to them locally and say at least they're the example for how Shenan can be grown. And for me, they're setting the bar at the highest here so near in the summer area of how, how it should be, should be done. Hey, can I pop in really quickly? And just, um, I just want to piggyback off of something that Brennan, you said earlier, is that the winemaker makes a difference. And I think that um, if, we, if we kind of zoom out and think of like, you know, the universe, and obviously um, I always, with Whitney, we always talk, and, and you know how much I believe in juju. Whether or not that's a real word or not, it's something that's real to us. And um, I think that it's natural for the winemaker to, to have a difference, to, to, to make a difference in the wines. And I, and I say that in the sense of, you know, uet has been around for since 1928, and um, our family got involved in 2003. Um, and I mean, transition is a fact of life. Definitely in the wine industry, it's, it's, it's part of, you know, what happens. Um, and, and, and so um, uh, our previous winemaker was in Fengue, and, 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 and then Jean-Marnard Bartholomé, and, and then just recently in this, this early, the end of 2019, you know, we're going through another, another transition. Um, and so I've gotten this question really actually quite often. Um, from, from other producers, from, from clients, from friends. And um, right now our winemaker is Benjamin Joliveau. He's from Bouvray. He's been with the estate um, officially since 2009, but has been in and out since 2002. And you say, okay, well, we don't change anything in how we work, right? But even, you know, in 2012, when Jean Bernardi, he, he officially took over, people would come to us and be like, what's different? And, and we, we couldn't really respond because what we would always say is nothing. Nothing has changed. But the one thing that you could say might be the change is the exchange of the energy. It's the, the people behind it. It's mm -hmm. that juju side that you can't, you can't pinpoint, you can't name. But, but, but I feel like it's so often that. It's, it's the unknowns that people, can't, we don't even know how to explain. That, that make all the difference because, you know, for us, it, what we do and how we work, it's just how we've always worked. There's always been generations working together, this transfer of knowledge. So what else could it be? For me, it's really the people yeah. and who you are, like not to get too weird, but like the soul of who you are and your energy kind of exchanging into kind of that ether of wine because the wine, wine is, is sorry, I almost talk French, excuse me. Yeah. Wine is something living. It's something real. That's why, you know, when we pop open a bottle that's old, it's like, okay, where is it at in its life right now? What does this window look like? So there's, there's always an exchange. And that's why where you are, where it's cellared makes a difference. And what happens? And anyway, I just want to kind of piggyback off that because. Yeah, and, for me, that's where like, I don't, want, I, don't want, I want to piggyback off of that. Really just to say one thing. I think the power of intention is even more you know, when it comes down to a saying that it's the winemaker that's behind it. I mean, there are winemakers that make tons of wines in this world, thousands of millions of different wines that are being made. For me, it's the, it's the question of intention. When I say intention, it's the vision. Sure. And if a winemaker doesn't have vision of where he's going, what he's doing, I think it's, I think that's what separates a lot of what's mediocre from what stands out with what Sarah and I are doing. Yeah, I think that with anything, it's the attention to detail and the intention. Intention is, and, and, and you know, now we're getting all, all, all like yogi, but it's that mindfulness. It's, it's really having the intention of knowing what you want to do. And, um, and, but, you know, and then I kind of argue that it's, 
sure the winemaker, but it's also the team. It's never just one person. Right. Um, and that's always really important for me to say because it's something that I really believe. It's so easy for us to say it's one person because, because it's easy. Because we can say, okay, this person has responsibility. And, and sure, the person does. But there's a whole team of people um, that create this family, that, create, that, are, that allow us to, to be able to drink these wines and enjoy them and, and explore. Um, but of course, you have to have kind of a vision always that people can follow people meeting the people on the team more so than anybody else because you make the wines you want to make because you like what you're doing. Right. I think it's dangerous to make wines because you want to respond to what, you know, somebody else wants to do in life. I feel like you should just do you, but curious. Yeah. Um, Sarah, just before we move on, there are a couple of questions that people yeah. have posed in the chat. Okay. Um, well, actually, why don't why don't we just move on to those? Um, the first question that I think will be interesting for both of you, since um, neither of you have crystal balls, um, is how do you how are you anticipating that um, the conditions surrounding COVID-19 will affect harvest and production this year? You can take that. I mean, I'll jump in. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, in terms of production side, I mean, the vines keep growing as they normally would, so there's nothing yeah. really like to say that. Past that, it might be a little bit where I'm really curious as to what are the you know, the different things that we're going to have to put into place in, in order to make, you know, people to come happen and everything. Like, it out. Yeah, it's just like, how is the management side of like the team and the figures, how is that going to go? Because already things are really tricky in France from an administrative point of view, um, from a legal point of view, or um, even hiring someone just to pick grapes. That on top of that, there's a pandemic and everything. So don't know. How do you work together in a row, face to face, right? when you're less than a meter, but you you can't have one person per row either. It's in, it's ineffective. And there's, sorry, see, I told you I would jump in, but it's, then you have like the harvest meals and all of the, the stuff that we don't even think of. We, we were talking about it in the team just the other yesterday. And those kinds of logistics are, are crazy. But like you said, the virus is indifferent to this storm around us. Like the vines have not stopped, even though, you know, everything is shut down i mean it's nature and that's the beauty of it that's the force of life is that it continues i don't know how we see it it's the hope i have uh, one other quick question uh it's one about tension in shannon and how it relates to ageability what role does does tension play and and how crucial of a factor is it in, in the ageability of the wine i think is the question Feel free to, to edit or be more specific if, if I missed it, Chairman. Well, that's um, it. You'll go. All you. No, no, go ahead, Sarah. I'm interested um, in your perspective. I think that I think that I personally love tension in the wines. It's it's you know we go back and forth the, at the estate, um, and I know we are probably going to talk about this later because the question is always what what you know is your favorite vineyard site or. I mean, you know, the, the, the PC answer is to say they're all like my kids and I can't choose one because they're all different and beautiful. It obviously depends on the vintage, but typically my preference is for Limon, right? And so Limon is plant, it's Tilex, and so there is a natural tension and, and, and spine in, in the wine. Um, at the same time, I, I think that Ageability has more to do with the balance in the wine than it does have to do with the tension. And tension is something that's more subjective. It's, 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 it's just what your palate prefers or it doesn't. But because there's no tension, that doesn't necessarily mean that the wine can or cannot age. That's what I would probably say. Like balance is the most, is, is really the most important. Yeah, but I would totally agree because you can have super high acidity. I mean, I think of 2013, so my second vintage in learning is just like we just had really really low alcohol content super high acidity really low ph the wines as once again as you said i mean with all things considered nature gave us what they gave what it gave us in 2013 so i'm going to be really clear about it. it was not the greatest 
biggest vintage, best vintage that we made. However, you know, it offered very approachable wines from early on. Yeah. Early on. However, they were edgy and it was not necessarily the most like, we're talking about tension and we, we get really juiced up about it. But when the vintages are cold here and there's only tension, it's not good. Like we have to think of tension within the context of the there context. needs to be some yeah. flesh, some body to the wine too, because if there's only just a skeleton, not really pretty, not really necessarily nice to it. Kind of rough. It can be. It can also be really beautiful. Kind of. It really just depends, and and you know, with different balances too, and, and different different soil types. You know, when we're talking about 30, 40, 50 years down the road, or you know, 10 or 20, the the flavor the flavor profiles of the vintages make a, make a real difference. And and if yeah. we say okay, uh, like you know, I was saying earlier, the wine is something living. Um, the, the, the feeling of tension, the perception of tension can also change throughout the lifetime of the wine. So you have kind of the base and you have, you know, the nature and the nurture, like, you know, both of those go into play when we're talking about something living. Yeah. Um, you just never know what direction, you know, the wine will take. It'll go into its ebbs and flows, especially Shannon that goes into its, you know, lovely dormancy after a few years. It just gets cranky, like, like you know, toddler and, and needs to take a nap and, and you accept that and you say okay we'll check in on you uh you know in a few years um but that's what makes it fun too but you can't say that oh just because there is or isn't tension right something's gonna happen you yeah. just we just don't know and that's why it's fun to, to open random bottles if you have the opportunity because it's like you're getting to know um that vintage and that wine again which is yeah and I want to jump in and just say, I think that's a huge fabric, you know, honestly. Of people like going in and they're harvesting whatever white grapes or even red grapes that they're farming right now, there's this huge fad. They see that wines that are a little bit more uh, lean, a little bit tighter, a little bit higher in the seed, that they maybe sell a little bit easier, that that's what the market is interested in. Yeah, well, that's nice. However, like people are going out and doing things. And not, honestly, I've tasted a lot of things that are green and are not interesting. So it's like, once again, it's a question of, in the context, within the wine, within the site, within the winemaker, it's just like, put things in perspective. Because just because you're make, making wine with tension, in, it's like, you can't just cookie cutter that and make it like, say, oh, it's, it's got No, especially because the variables are all so different, right? Yeah. Every year, you can't say, this is exactly what I'm gonna do or how I'm gonna do it. I mean, you gotta yeah. go with the flow. Yeah. Yeah. Whitney, you're still Whitney, on are mute. are you talking? You're on mute still. <laughs> I am. You guys can't read my lips? I'm trying. Um, <laughs> there's a, a, another question that, that Brendan, um, you're a little bit free from because it's about, it's about legacy. Uh -huh. um, and um, the question is really about, in the context of, say, you, you could, Brendan, speak to Guiberto, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, in the context of Huet and Guiberto, how one balances the historic sense or expectations on both of these these places uh i mean speaking on behalf of roman Giberto, i would say that he he's a he's a free thinker too so he's not going to let anybody tell him what he can or can't do um however he and at the same time he's a he's a pioneer in what he's doing so it's you know, he, he's respecting, I think, historically what's been done in terms of growing Chenin and Breze and making wines that um, are very reflective of the site, the vintage, and the winemaker. Um, and so he's very respectful in that way. Um, you know, he's the first one of his family and the Giberto family to actually bottle the wines um, coming from his estate. So it's maybe a little too early. He doesn't have a whole lot of pressure in the same way maybe that Antoine Foucault Dominique Clay had with Claude Rougeard. So that'd be more of an interesting question to ask someone like him. Um, myself, it's really free in the sense that I don't go and hang out with, I mean, I have a couple of winemakers who I'm friends with here in the area. I'm kind of a hermit, like, I, Me too. I, yeah, I do my work, I come home and I get up and I do the same work the next day or a different work the next day. Um, I get it done and I don't, I'm not, in, I mean, I'm influenced in the sense that I have the wines that I like to drink, whether they be in the summer area. I love wines from Burgundy, Champagne, Rhone, 
I mean, all over France and all over the world, I have a wines that I like and a style of wines that I like. And that's what influences me. And um, it's not the market. It's not what people are saying about my wine because I'm making the wines that I like to make that I like to drink. And that's what a lot of people told me when I'm getting into it, is like, make the wines that you like to drink. And it just so happens that the wines I like to drink are the wines also that are, you know, that other people are interested in. And, and, and I hope that, you know, that's because maybe once again, that question of intention, maybe it's a question of place, I don't know, but I, I know that it's, it's um, you know, I, I'm really free in what I'm doing and I think that, that that's good. And I'm free in what I'm doing and yet I feel like I'm still holding on to what, I mean, I'm saying all of this with the most huge sense of humility of like, I'm an American coming from the outside with no winemaking experience. Like I'm so fresh into this game. Amazing. And at, this, and at the same time, like I have so much respect and it's not, it's, I have all that respect that I need to give to the, few, the past generation so that I can continue to be also a visionary and push forward for the quality of the wines that we're making here. Whether you be an American or French or whoever, you know. Brendan, do you feel to a certain extent that the legacy that you are carrying on is one that's lost or one that was lost? Yes, in so many, yes, quite clearly. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I feel very honored to be here is because historically, Somir was an area um, that was on the, the maps um, in terms of the wine that were being made. Breze was historically a site um, that was um, you know, known in the world of wines here in France a long time ago. And I feel like it's just kind of a, something that needs to be picked up and, and the flag needs to be raised again in the right way. Yes. Yeah, and on my, on my end, um, to answer that super loaded question, thanks whoever said it. Um, it's, it's hard, I think it, I think it also ultimately actually goes back to, to what we were saying in the beginning, being outsiders and, um, and the core of what wine kind of means to you. Um, because especially with our involvement here at UET, of course, um, there's a lot of expectation and, and we do feel that pressure. At the same time, um, going back to what I said earlier, you do the best you can. And um, we have a really, really solid team. Um, and you have to, it, it's, it's really about kind of the idea of appreciating what's come before you and learning from that and taking as much as much experience and as much knowledge and as much information as you can and using that in, in the context of what today is because obviously no moment, no, no year, no wine is ever exactly the same. Um, so, so if, you know, for us, wine remains to be something that's enjoyable, that brings people together and, and that can actually go back to the times of Gaston Uet, who was a POW. And, um, there's this, there's this amazing story that that it's you know thanks to wine is is how he connected with with the German soldiers and 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 how he connected to his fellow soldiers and so it's kind of like taking that idea that we randomly kind of in this world shared you see, I mean I don't know I think it's random but um and 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 bringing it to what it is today and, and just reminding ourselves that this is wine and we're so lucky to do what we do we're so lucky to work close with nature. Um, is there an expectation? Of course there is, but that's a pressure that we can choose to embrace or kind of fight against and be scared of it. Um, and if, I, I mean, we also, we, we talk about it often, oh, well, not super often because it's sort of intense, but um, if, you, if you understand the kind of gravity of, of what came before you and how important what the work that they did was and, and what they represented and what they continued to represent, um, then I think that you have, you know, within you then, um, the resources to grow and to respond. Um, it, yeah, I mean, it, it, it can be, it can be, um, a lot, right? Because like, we're going back to the human nature. It's people want to assume things. People want these expectations. Ultimately we are vessels. We are just a few pages all of us in this huge book of, you know, the Clos du Borg vines is, Clos du Borg dates officially until the, since the eighth century, right? What, like 17 years is literally just a few pages in this book of Clos du Borg. And I think it would be um, very egotistical and, and 
to say, oh, yeah, it's, 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 it's simply our job to, to make sure that this story is continuing to be written and that there's an intention that it's written properly with good grammar and punctuation. I don't know. Another question from the audience. Uh, this one's, I guess, a, just a layer further on ageability. What are some of the key aromatic profiles that you enjoy in Shannon that has a bit of bottle age? And at what point in the age do you expect those to develop? Obviously accounting for the difference between dry and, and sweeter Shannons. That's such a question. You guys are really question. good at answering questions or asking questions. What? You want to take it? Man, um, gosh. Yeah, I, I don't have any culture of su sweet wines in the way that Sarah does, so I'll let Sarah talk about that. At least in the the wines, you know, I've I had the opportunity of tasting like Clorgeard makes a lot of. I mean, most of their wines are red wines, not even Franc. And I tasted from their nineteen, I think, earliest back. I went was like nineteen fifty six. Some white wines, and those wines are still like fresh. I mean, there's a certain freshness to the wines. And you're thinking like, okay, like wrap your head around this. Like these are white wines that are still fresh after like half a decade. Um, so with that said, I mean, we don't have to necessarily go a half a decade back for the aromatic profile to be changing and everything past that. I often find that after, you know, with these wines that I think Sarah and I are making, like aromatically things for me tend to change after eight to 10 years, I would say. I mean, this is like big ball. I mean, this is like, generally speaking, this is really, really hard to answer because I've opened some bottles that like, I say that and they're still tasting the same way that they did 10 years ago too. So it's kind of like, wow, how to answer that. But um, coming from Domingue Berto and myself, I mean, myself, it's a little too young to say, I'm still young to say. But uh, Roland's wines, I mean, definitely like 10 year, eight to 10 years on, like they start getting into, I would say kind of more of like the, the, the at least the élevage starts getting away and we start getting some of the smokiness that I think often is very characteristic of Breze itself. Uh, once we, whoever you're tasting and making all, you know, wines from Breze, there's often this kind of like, um, smokiness or almost kind of like a roasted side to the roasted without it being burnt or anything but kind of like this roasted skin side of kind of like a aromatic profile that we're getting um, from Brezze itself after some age but that's so hard that's such a hard answer to, to, to give. Sarah I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, it's, it's pretty rough um, because and I kind of feel like it's almost I'm, but I'm not trying to cop out but um it really depends on the vintage, yeah. right? Because uh, there can be a vintage that, um, for whatever reason, because of the balance, because of the conditions, um, five years in, um, you'll start getting some, some of those kind of older honey brioche aromas. Um, there could be a vintage like 1985, for example, that for the first, literally the 30 years of its life, it was like a new wine. Yeah. Um, and that was due to climatic conditions during the season. There was some hydric stress, and so that's just, just how the, you know, it, the, what happens in the growing season, that's why it's so important. It ultimately does translate in the bottle. And so like, you know, for us, which is one of the things I love to do is kind of, is when we blind taste, we kind of try to get a sense of what we're tasting on the palate. And then that's how we try to figure out what the vintage is to see if it, it, it's really translating. Um, and I say, you know, 85, it stayed young um, for the first 30 years of its life and just, just only in the last two years or so um, has started taking on kind of that old wine feel. Um, and so it's so hard to say, you know, after X amount of time, um, this is going to happen. At the same time, it, it's hard because, you know, the wines of Uet are known for their ageability. Um, I always say too that Closingborg and Lemont they get a lot of they get a lot of praise and for me uh, it's justified or great terroirs at the same time like all the old wines that we talk of um, came from Olieu so there's something really special about that but you know to this day 
Um, I feel as though there's a few people watching still that that have had you know the the, the luck to um, to taste some really old bottles, and you know you can pull a bottle and it's still fresh. And it's not even about, okay, it needs some time to open because, you know, it's living. So if you've been in a closet that's been locked for, you know, 70 years, well, how would you feel about it? Like, um, it's still young. So, so when those aromatics start coming in, it can be anywhere from, like, like you said, eight to 10 years, but it can also be, you know, 20, 30 or 40 years. Um, it depends on, on the, the profile of the vintage, if it was more fruity, if it was more floral, what the acids were like, and how that evolves and how they interact. Brendan, I have a little 17 that I'm sipping yeah. on. It's, uh, it's funny to revisit a wine that like, you know, on kind of our side of the table, you tend to have something the minute it lands and you kind of focus on it as a when it's super, super fresh, and then you revisit it at kind of like uneven intervals. Yeah. But I feel like with this 17, it's like in this really, it's finally in like a really harmonious place. Yeah. And, and, and you see that like that electric shock that you referred to earlier has now kind of not receded, but it's come into harmony exactly. with, with, with power that's underneath it. So that like both components are right. kind of more harmonious and, and impactful. So it's it's funny to it's funny to revisit this now. Obviously, it's funny to revisit it with you on a, on a webcam. But uh, yeah, <laughs> I wish it would have been not, in that place. But yeah, Seventeen's super classic, right? Or classic in quotes. Seventeen was for me a very like traditional, like I say traditional, very Loire, like beautiful Loire vintage for us, balance. Um, good acidity, not high alcohol. Um, just a, I would say, a very elegant vintage. Um, what we're seeing from 18 to 19 is, or what Sarah was saying, much more extreme. 18 is bigger, there's more alcohol content. Um, and 19, for myself, was probably the best vintage that I've made, actually. Um, um, just great ripeness, low alcohol content, really beautiful to see, and beautiful structure. Um, so I don't know, it's just, once again, that's to say, yes, there's that vintage aspect of it. And then there's also the, where the winemaker is going with the wines. And, um, I think the focus is becoming more clear for myself of what I'm going to do, so that helps too. But yes, you see, you know, that I want to just jump in really quickly and say, yes, we're coming. Um, Jeremy was asking about the question around tension. Myself, I often tell people that I prefer to pick with a little bit more acidity than not enough because acidity is something that we can work with in terms of how we're aging the wines in the barrel or in other vessels beforehand. And I think that's not something that you can get back once you're, if you wait too long. And I think that's something that in time will become integrated into the wine if you're picking at a point too where there can be some flesh and you're also understanding how to age that wine. It's so hard to say too because, you know, when I think of low acid, low acid vintages, you know, one of the big ones that we talk about often is 2003. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we keep going back to this idea of accepting it for what it is. And it was a low acid vintage, but it, it is who it is. And, and, you know, there was that fear, okay, the wines are going to fall as a sweet wine vintage. Okay, well, what's going to happen? And Quite honestly, we are so excited every time we taste an 03 because it's fresh. Mm. And it was sort of the lesson that we took from it is, sure, you would prefer to have a little bit more acid. At the same time, if that's what the vintage is giving you, yeah. you have to respect it too and work accordingly and trust that kind of the work and the expression, while atypic, well, it is, it's, it's kind of uh, unique unto itself. And it's just another layer of why what we do is so interesting because it was really a lesson I think that all of us have had to learn yeah. specifically in talking about kind of low acid vintages. Like, no, it, it, we don't have to worry. It, 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 that's just what the vintage is. And it's not to say that it, it's going to fall or it's not going to be able to age. It's, you know, Gaston Uet would often um, would compare vintages like 03 to the 47s. Right, so which, which kind of shifts your thinking of it. 
because it's like that, it's it's not necessarily a, a bad thing. Like 18, you know, very sweet. That's a beautiful thing. That's why we we work throughout the years to make those wines, and, and then you just gotta respect for respect it for what it what it is. Yep. Hmm. What's everybody drinking? We haven't talked about that. This, this 18 is awesome, Sarah. What is it? Well, oh, yeah. Nice. Thanks. Thank you. First day of harvest, that one. When you just take it and close your work. So I think, unless anyone has any other questions, we might be able to uh, wrap up and uh, I can go drink the rest of these two bottles. <laughs> I don't know what you guys have planned this afternoon, but my plans have shifted. <laughs> <laughs> well, where we are, we're we're in this like real lucky spot where the days are forever long, right? Right, Brendan. So like, yeah. so you can get a lot done when the sun rises at like five and it sets at like ten thirty. Yeah, yeah. Almost, it's almost inappropriate because you feel like you need to keep on working, and you're like, why am I so tired? Yeah. But um. It's amazing this time of year. I love it. I'm gonna go out into my vegetable garden and go water. Yes. What do you have planted? Yeah. Oh gosh, too much. <laughs> you, well, we just we just went nuts too because you never know with confinement. We were like, we're just gonna get our plants in. And we got two more chickens. Just okay. like <laughs> at least we have eggs. Oh, man. All right. Well, thanks everybody yeah, for joining us. Everybody. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank so, you. Good seeing you in person and uh, being able to drink together. Yeah, I love that. that. Really, it's like weird to speak so much English at once. Yeah. Isn't it? <laughs> oh, it feels so good. It feels real good. Yeah. All right. Well, Thank we really everybody. enjoyed it. Thanks so much to everyone who joined and to the two of you. Um, it was really, really a great conversation. Yeah, well, thanks, guys. I appreciate it. It's super enjoyable. Thanks, Bye. guys. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.